Last time I gave you a brief uh, introduction to, to, to water waves, uh, and uh, today for the first five minutes I'll uh, remind you just a few things from last time. So uh, uh, remember that uh, we're looking at the equations of motion for a fluid in some domain, omega of t. And we're not looking at uh, 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 general fluid in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, fluid domain, but we're looking at a fluid that's either uh, irrotational or has constant vorticity. And because of that, uh, the equations of motion for the fluid are reduced to equations of motions on this free interface. And on this free interface, you're looking at two objects. First, you're looking at the motion of the interface itself. And second, you're looking at the velocity potential on this interface. So you have this surface gamma of t and your unknowns will be first the interface. gamma of t, and secondly, the velocity potential the velocity potential, we called it phi, restricted to gamma of t. So uh, you expect this water wave equations to be a system, a system uh, describing the motion of these two, uh, two variables. Now, um, in studying this evolution, there's a couple of parameters that I introduced last time, which I'll remind you. So one parameter that appears is g, which is the gravity. A second parameter that I will use is sigma. This is the surface tension. Um, a third parameter that uh, we'll, we'll use in, in one case, at least, uh, will be the uh, C, which I'll use for the vorticity. So one of the models I wanted to tell you about is a model of fluid in this domain, which has constant vorticity rather than be irrotational. And the last parameter that will come up will be H, uh, which will be the depth of the fluid. So um, I'll mention two, two interesting situations, one when the depth is infinite and the other when the depth is finite. Now, for my purposes here, the bottom of the fluid is going to be flat. And somebody asked me about this last time, uh, the, uh, what happens when you um, trade a, a flat interface for a non-flat interface is uh, all in terms of the action, the long time uh, behavior of the flow. For the short time behavior, it makes no difference, but for the long time behavior, it is important that the bottom is flat. All right. Uh, and now, uh, in terms of uh, these uh, four parameters uh, in here, let me remind you what are the four problems that uh, uh, we were looking at. Uh, so the first problem uh, was when uh, gravity is greater than zero. Um, surface tension is equal to zero, the depth, uh, well, vorticity is zero, if you want, and the depth is infinite. Uh, so these are the pure gravity waves in an uh, infinite, uh, in infinite depth. Uh, the second problem was when uh, gravity is equal to zero, sigma greater than zero, again, C is equal to zero, and H is infinite. These are capillary waves. Uh, of infinite depth, so waves which are driven by, by the surface tension. The third problem was when we have gravity and we have uh, no surface tension uh, and uh, uh, now we, we're going to allow for uh, non-zero um, uh, vorticity and again in infinite depth. Here, the vorticity does not have a sign, uh, and the reason for, for this is because you can always change the sign of the vorticity by reversing the time direction. Um, uh, introducing vorticity in here somehow breaks the symmetry between waves that move to the left and wave that waves that move to the, to the right, and so uh, this means that the equations are no longer symmetric with respect to time reversal. Otherwise, the water wave equations are fully reversible, and when you change the time direction, you get the very same thing, but not in this case. Okay, and the fourth problem uh, that I will uh, mention is 
the, the case when you have gravity, again, no, surf, no surface tension, uh, so sigma is equal to zero, no vorticity, but now uh, the depth of the fluid is less than uh, infinite. So still gravity waves, but gravity waves on a finite bottom. Um, and maybe I'll, I should also remind you that um, um, all of these uh, projects are joint work with uh, uh, Mihail Eiflim. And then in the first project, uh, uh, one part of it is also joint with uh, John Hunter. And on the last project, this is joint work also with uh, Benjamin Harrop Griffiths. Now, one thing that I will uh, not do today is write down uh, four sets of equations for you. Uh, that would take way too much time. Uh, but uh, what I will uh, try to do is to focus more on, on the first model, uh, just because it's simpler. And maybe is it 2D or 2D? this is 2D. 2D. Everything that I say is 2D. So I'll focus more on the first uh, model and, and maybe uh, tell you what, uh, what changes to, to when you go to the other models. And the first uh, idea that I wanted to introduce to you in terms of uh, studying these models, which I mentioned last time, is the use of uh, holomorphic coordinates. Um, and uh, of course, th this is not, not our idea. Uh, this uh, is, uh, as I said last time, almost 100 years old. Uh, but it's an idea that uh, turns out to be very useful in working with the, these equations and studying their long time dynamics. Um, and uh, Claude's question, answering also Claude's question, this, this is also the reason we stay in two dimensions, because these coordinates are uh, well suited to uh, the two-dimensional problem. So the idea here is the following. You have your fluid domain, either with finite or infinite bottom. And part of the problem when you're looking at this domain is that you have to deal with the Dirichlet to Neumann map associated to the Laplace equation in this domain. That's a, uh, so the differential operator, uh, it's, it's not a multiplier, it has variable coefficients, and further, the coefficients depend on the unknown functions in, uh, uh, in your problem. So that's uh, difficult to deal, not impossible to deal uh, in this problem, but difficult to deal with. And so it would be more, it would be nicer if one could diagonalize this Dirichlet to Neumann operator. And so the idea is, instead of working with this domain, you pick up a flat domain, and I'm drawing this flat domain as a strip, uh, but really, you have two scenarios. One, when you have finite bottom, and here you have uh, your, your water domain, and here you have a strip. And the other scenario is where you have infinite bottom, so you push the bottom out. And then here you have your infinite bottom, here you have a half plane. So on the right here, you're either working on a half plane or uh, on a strip. And so by the Riemann mapping theorem, you can uh, uh, find a conformal transformation, a uh, conformal map between these two domains. Uh, just to, to set the notations, I'll, I'll use here maybe the letter uh, zeta, which is alpha plus i beta. Uh, and here I'll use uh, the letter z, and the coordinates are going to be denoted by uh, x plus i y. So z is a function of zeta. And instead of uh, writing our equation in this domain, I'm going to reparametrize the domain. And in particular, I'm going to reparametrize the surface using this conformal map. And the, 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 the main point of this is, again, to diagonalize the Dirichlet to, uh, to Neumann map. And so um, what are going to be uh, the, the uh, new variables under this holomorphic uh, coordinates. So one variable here is going to be uh, the conformal map itself that uh, 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 will describe the shape of the domain. Uh, but we don't need the full conformal map to, uh, to describe this domain. We just need the restriction of this conformal map to the top in here. So this is, let's call this uh, uh, line beta is equal to 0. This would be beta is equal to minus h. Uh, and, and here 
this is y is equal to minus h. And, and by the way, so in, in this conformal map, we're looking at uh, not all possible conformal maps. We're looking at maps that take the bottom to the bottom and the top to the top and the infinities to the appropriate uh, infinities. And when you do this, you're really left with the one uh, a single degree of freedom uh, in the finite bottom case. And this is the horizontal translations of this domain. So you have one ambiguity in here. Whereas when you look at the infinite bottom case, you have two degrees of freedom. You have horizontal translations and scaling, if you want, in the choice of this uh, conformal map. And you want to fix this uh, uh, two degrees of freedom so that your equation is uniquely determined. Okay, so coming back to our variables, the first variable will be the function z of alpha, which is z, the conformal map itself, restricted to the top, restricted to the region where beta is equal to zero. And then our second variable, so this describes the surface, and our second variable should describe the, um, as I said before, the uh, uh, velocity potential uh, on the top. But now it's very convenient to think of this velocity potential also uh, as coming from a holomorphic uh, function in this domain. And then the simple observation, uh, maybe let me write it here, is that uh, since the uh, velocity potential phi uh, satisfies the Laplace equation, well, this means that it has a harmonic conjugate. Uh, and the harmonic conjugate turns out to be exactly the stream function that I also introduced last time associated to the fluid. And so this means that if I'm looking at phi plus i theta, this will be uh, a holomorphic function in the fluid domain in here, okay? But now, I already have my change of coordinates from here to here, so composing with this change of uh, coordinates, I can think of this as a single holomorphic function of the variable zeta uh, in, uh, in, in, in this domain. So this requires fixing the, uh, the conformal transformation from here to here. And uh, lastly, uh, I don't, again, also in terms of q, I don't need to look at all values of q uh, in this uh, strip or in this half plane, but I only need to look at q on the top. That will determine what happens on the bottom. Uh, and so uh, my second variable will be q of alpha, which is um, phi plus i theta restricted to the top, to beta is equal to zero. So, uh, Z describes the surface, and Q uh, describes the velocity potential together with its complex conjugate. Now, in terms of the size of these objects, naively, in a reasonable setting, you think of Q as being something bounded, but Z will not be something bounded, all right? Uh, and so because of this, uh, b because infinity is mapped into infinity, and because of this it is convenient to replace this variable z by a, a, a different variable where you take out the leading part. Uh, so let me define that, w of alpha to be z of alpha minus alpha. And I want to assume that this guy is bounded, and you will immediately realize that the moment I'm assuming that this guy is bounding, bounded, I have removed scaling from the degrees of freedom in here, right? Because alpha, uh, if I rescale z and not rescale alpha, then this will no longer be a bounded function. Okay, so I'm, I'm still left with the horizontal translations, and that has to do with constants, and uh, constants are uh, much easier to handle in this theory. Now, what is the state space? What are the, cl the class of functions for z and q that we're looking at here? Um, and so the important observation is you don't want to look at arbitrary functions z and q. Uh, z and q instead will, uh, will be functions which are defined on the top, but which have holomorphic extensions um, in, 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 in the fluid, in the, in, this, in the model domain. Okay, so z and q have holomorphic. Maybe, let me use w in here and you'll see in a moment why. in a in, uh, uh, model domain. And uh, furthermore, 
they have some, some decay conditions uh, uh, which vary depending on, uh, they, they have in, in, in some sense some boundary conditions on the bottom. And to describe these boundary conditions, I'll have to discriminate between finite depth and infinite depth. So if the depth is infinite, then I expect W and Q to go to zero, uh, more like their uh, holomorphic extensions uh, at, uh, as if you want beta goes to minus infinity. So I have holomorphic functions in a half plane and they go to zero at infinity. Um, and if instead the depth is uh, finite, then these functions w and q, um, of course, they'll, they'll not be uh, equal to zero in here. That will be way too much to ask because if you have a holomorphic function that's equal to zero here, it has to be zero everywhere, right? But instead, the piece of information that you get uh, for q uh, because of the boundary condition on the bottom and uh, for w by construction is that w and q uh, are real on the bottom. Okay, so from here on, our functions will be functions which uh, live in this class. They have holomorphic extensions in the model domain, and they have either decay at, uh, uh, on the bottom, or they are real on the bottom. And because of these conditions, in particular, what happens on the top uniquely determines what happens in the entire domain. Um, and so uh, I'm going to make this a definition. We call such functions, this is a slight abuse of terminology, holomorphic. Okay, normally you call holomorphic functions functions in open domain, but here we're going to, just to keep terminology short, to call holomorphic functions functions which are the traces on the top of holomorphic functions which satisfy certain boundary condition on the bottom. And carefully observe in here that if you look at the space of holomorphic functions, that's obviously an algebra, okay? But in the infinite depth case, this is a complex algebra, whereas in the uh, uh, finite bottom case, this is no longer a complex algebra, it's only a real algebra. So multiplication i is not a holomorphic function in the finite bottom case, just for the sake of. Okay, and um, of course you can uh, also describe these functions um, uh, in, uh, in th this class of holomorphic functions um, in, a, in a Fourier fashion. Um, and so in, again I'll discuss the two scenarios. If the depth is, equal to is, is infinite, then uh, these functions have the property that uh, the Fourier transform uh, of u is supported in the region where xi is smaller than zero. So it has only negative frequencies. And if you have a function that has only negative frequencies, then the real uh, and the imaginary part of these two functions are related. Um, uh, and, and, and precisely the, the relation between these two is that the imaginary part of u is the Hilbert transform of the real part of u. So uh, we're looking at functions specifically which satisfy this relation. Um, and um, in this context, you can also talk about anti-holomorphic functions. And anti-holomorphic functions are functions which uh, are uh, satisfy the same condition but have anti-holomorphic extensions. And of course, if function is holomorphic, then its complex conjugate will be anti-holomorphic. Uh, so you have the same relation but with a minus sign. And then the interesting object to, to work with in here is the projector, the projector to negative frequencies, okay? So P is the projector to negative frequencies. And you can relate this projector to the Hilbert transform. Um, so P will be one minus identity, I times the Hilbert transform divided by two. And here I should caution you that uh, various uh, parts of the literature use different conventions for the sign in the Hilbert transform. So if, you're, if you might be slightly confused in here, 
this may be because I'm just using a different convention from uh, one you have uh, seen in the past. Um, so this is what happens in the infinite depth case. Now in the finite depth case, um, uh, so when the depth is, uh, is finite, uh, the situation changes a little bit uh, because now instead of solving the Laplace equation in the infinite domain, you solve the Laplace equation in a strip. And so this relation will be replaced by the following relation. Uh, so now uh, you no longer have the Fourier transform of u supported in sign negative. Instead, you're going to have the following relation. Uh, u hat of, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll try hard to get the signs right, uh, minus xi uh, is equal to um, e to the power, uh, I think, um, h c times u hat of c bar. So this is the relation you're looking at. So now these functions have both positive and negative frequencies. Um, and instead of having this uh, relation which involves the Hilbert transform, you're going to have a different relation. That's the imaginary part of u is equal to uh, something that also depends on height till h of real part of u. And this is what's called uh, the Tilbert transform. Uh, apparently, uh, <laughs> I learned this name from my collaborators, but when I tried to look it up in the literature, I could not really find it, except in some software package. Um, so, but it's a good name, it, it fits, Hilbert Tilbert. Uh, apparently, Tilbert is also a name I found uh, by, uh, during my search. Um, okay, uh, and, and this operator uh, is defined by uh, its symbol. It's a multiplier, uh, is minus i hyperbolic tangent of h psi. So don't confuse the two h's, right? Uh, <coughs> Let me connect the two. Um, and so then uh, the projector, uh, you can also talk about uh, anti-holomorphic functions with the opposite sign, obviously. Um, and um, so uh, you have uh, a similar projector to, 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 to this space of holomorphic functions. Uh, I'll write it down for you. Um, so P, this depends on H of U is equal to one half this will, is never going to be used, but just for your curiosity, uh, well, a view plus one half i uh, one plus i till the transform inverse. Uh, this is real part of you. And this is the imaginary part of you. Um, maybe when you talk, when you think about this, uh, this projectors, I should say, uh, in in this case, uh, this uh, the reason we call this a project. This is a proje this is an orthogonal projector in L two. So here you're thinking of the L two setting, but here it doesn't make so much sense to think of the L two setting because, in particular, this guy will be unbounded in L two because you're inverting this symbol, and so here uh, you you have to work with a different. Uh, uh, Hilbert space, I'll denote it by this, uh, with a norm, uh, norm of u in this uh, space will be equal to um, norm of uh, imaginary, well, <coughs> h times the real part of u in L2 plus norm of imaginary part of u in L2. Okay, so for imaginary part, you use L2, but for the real part, you use this multiplier. And what this multiplier means, uh, this is still an L2 norm at high frequencies, but when you look at this guy at low frequencies, uh, in at, at low frequency, this is like a differentiation operator. So you're at low frequencies here, you're, you're only controlling the derivative of u. And in particular, this means that you, you don't have any access to the constants. Uh, in the function u, okay? Um, but this, this space will be very nice and, and consistent with uh, what I uh, want to tell you uh, later. 
All right, and uh, this uh, this projector here and this uh, projector here will play absolutely identical roles uh, in writing down the equation. So when I write down the equations, in particular for um, one case one and case four, the equations will be exactly the same with just uh, different meanings for everything that I'm writing. Um, okay, so <coughs> one thing that uh, let's see. One thing that I will not have time to, to, to do for you is to show you how, how uh, one, one actually derives the equations in holomorphic coordinates. Um, so instead of that, uh, I'll just uh, write down the equations um, and then I'll spend some time uh, explaining their, their structure. So uh, we have these two variables, W and Q. These are holomorphic variables. Um, and so in this space of holomorphic functions, we're going to look at the following evolution. Uh, so Wt plus f times 1 plus W alpha is equal to 0. So this is the equation for the evolution of W. And the equation for the evolution of Q, uh, uh, fq alpha minus igw uh, plus uh, the uh, projection of Q alpha square over j, I'll explain in a moment all the notations, uh, plus i sigma projection of the w alpha alpha divided by j to the power 1 half 1 plus w alpha minus its complex conjugate, just for brevity, is equal to 0. Uh, so this is an equation that, uh, this is a system of equations that describes uh, uh, at least the cases 1, 3, and 4 in here. And if you wanted to also look at uh, the case when you have a, a non-zero um, uh, vorticity, uh, instead of 0 here, uh, you're going to put uh, the vorticity times uh, some expression. And here, you're going to have also a linear term in the vorticity uh, times some longer expression. All right. So uh, this is for the case 3, my uh, green color coding, if you want. And uh, important to, to remember, to, 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 to observe in, in here, is that uh, these uh, corrections, when you have vorticity, also uh, includes linear terms. And because it includes linear terms, it will change uh, the dispersion relation for the problem. And I'll comment more on that later. So what are the objects in this uh, uh, long expression? Um, so uh, J is a natural object. This is the uh, Jacobian of the change of coordinates from one setting to the other. So it's 1 plus W alpha square. Um, and then f is equal to the uh, uh, projection of q alpha minus q alpha bar divided by j. Now, uh, if you, if you uh, just look at this, this equation, let's say when I looked at these equations for the first time, look at them, you, you pretty much see nothing. Um, okay, you see that there are nonlinear equations. Uh, you see that they are complicated. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can simplify them by uh, uh, setting some of the parameters to zero. So, for instance, if you set the vorticity to zero and the surface tension to zero, you're left only with this part of the equations, which might seem more manageable, and it is more manageable. Where is hidden the derivative I'm getting to that, yes. So what you don't see in these equations is the Dirichlet to Neumann map. And the reason you don't see the Dirichlet to Neumann map is that in these equations, we're talking about the Dirichlet to Neumann map on the model domain. And on the model domain, the Dirichlet to Neumann map is just the uh, absolute value of d. Okay. Uh, and so uh, in some sense, the role of the Dirichlet to Neumann map in this equation is played by all of these projectors that you see. Uh, projectors time a derivative, that's something very close to uh, Dirichlet to Neumann map. 
All right. Uh, one thing that might be misleading, actually, in this formulation is the following. You, you look at the uh, uh, Euler equations, and what is the, the leading term in the Euler equation is the transport, right? And then there's some coupling because of the incompressibility condition. You might say, oh, this looks like a transport equation. You have to be careful, because this f in here is a holomorphic function. It's a projection. In particular, this, it, it cannot be real, right? If it were real, it, ha it had to be constant. Had to be zero actually. So this is not a transport equation, not yet. Uh, but still, eventually we want to think of this as some sort of transport equation. And uh, when you have a fully nonlinear equation, how do you understand its character? Uh, well, the obvious thing to do is to linearize it, right? And you look at the linearization and try to understand what, what type of equation is the linearized equation. And uh, this is the next thing I'll try to show you. And I could actually use this board. And of course, if I wanted to write the, uh, all, the, all the, the full linearized equations, my choice of this board would be very poor. Uh, but uh, first, uh, first thing you want to do with the linearized equations is you want to understand what is the leading part of the linearized equations. So let me call by <coughs> w and q the linearized variables. Okay? Um, and so now I would like to write down an equation for dt of w and q. And in a first approximation, one thing that you're going to observe in here is that uh, the expressions that you're going to get on the right uh, will contain the following variables. They'll contain, of course, uh, w alpha, q alpha. Uh, maybe you'll see a little bit of w and q. Maybe you'll see also some w alpha bar and q alpha bar, right? There's complex conjugates arising in here. Complex conjugates are anti-holomorphic. We're not very much worried about the anti-holomorphic components because uh, those get killed by the projections. So really, the leading part when you compute the linearized equation is the part that has the uh, derivative. And so at the level of the linearized equation, this will look like some matrix uh, times d alpha w q plus some lower order terms. And so when you see a system like this, you'll think, oh, this, is, this may well be something hyperbolic. We'd like this to be something hyperbolic, given that we started with the Euler equation. Uh, and so the important object is to understand what this matrix is. Now, this matrix actually is not very hard to compute. What you have to do is you have to uh, differentiate these equations with respect to a big W and big Q. Uh, but you only care about the differentiation with respect to the holomorphic component, not with respect to anti-holomorphic component. So for instance, when I'm looking at J, I only care about the 1 plus W alpha component of J. When I'm looking at this expression, I'm going to care only about Q alpha and the 1 plus W alpha plus from, from J. So it's an easy exercise to do the computation. And so I'll write down this matrix for you. And I'll write, the, write it down in a form that's easy to, to read. OK? Hopefully, I can fit it in. Um, so, so what you get in here, you in inherit the f, obviously. Um, but this f gets coupled with another guy, q alpha bar uh, over j. And some fraction here. This is a little bit long. Um, so I can, I can come on, this fraction divided by j. Um, and here, 1 plus over 1 plus w alpha bar uh, minus q alpha square divided by j times 1 plus w alpha. Um, it seems uh, tedious, but believe me, this is worth it. Uh, over j, and then plus q alpha over j. All right. So uh, we want to understand what what kind of matrix is this, right? In particular, we want to understand what are its eigenvalues. 
Uh, and one uh, obvious uh, remark in here is that in this matrix you have a multiple of the identity, right? The multiple of the identity is the object that contains this guys, right? And now what happens with the remaining matrix? Suppose I take this guys out. Well, the remaining matrix, first of all, has trace zero, okay? And then it's very easy to see that it also has determinant zero. So the remaining matrix has a double zero uh, eigenvalue. Um, so, uh, but of course, it's not uh, diagonalizable, right? It's going to be, if you diagonalize it, you're going to get the obvious Jordan block. And so this matrix has a double uh, um, eigenvalue, and the double, double eigenvalue is given by this uh, object, f plus q alpha bar over j. We're not yet out of the woods. We'd like this to be a hyperbolic equation, so we'd like this object to be real, right? Um, so first thing we do always is we uh, baptize it. Uh, um, so I'm going to use the letter uh, b for this. Um, and um, maybe I, I can put that uh, on this board. Actually, I'll, I'll write it down here because I, I might want to uh, save it for later. Okay, so uh, B is going to turn out to be, uh, again, a, a, a brief computation, two times the uh, real part of the projection of um, um, Q alpha over J. Okay, so this is indeed uh, a real object. So this means that our problem has at, at heart is, uh, is a hyperbolic problem, but uh, a hyperbolic problem with a double speed. This is no surprise, right? Because if you think of the Euler equations, everything gets transported with the same speed. Now, what is the meaning of this speed b that we see in here? Uh, one thing I was telling you about last time was the fact that you have this gauge freedom having to do with the changes of coordinates. And in particular, we choose some non-standard coordinates in here. So this b really is the velocity that comes from the change of coordinates. If you want, b is the difference between our coordinates and the Lagrangian coordinates. In the same way as the standard velocity is the difference between the Eulerian coordinates and the Lagrangian coordinates. Okay? So, so, so far so good, uh, and I'll tell you that we were really happy when we got this guy to be real when we were computing the uh, equations because that uh, meant we, we are not making any, any big mistakes. But now, uh, coming back to our matrix in here, one thing you, want to, you always want to do when you see uh, um, uh, a, a matrix like this with the double eigenvalues, you want to diagonalize it. Of course, it will not be diagonalizable, but you want to put it in some good Jordan form, right? Um, and uh, there's, there's one very simple uh, change of variable that does that. Um, and so that's from w and q going to the pair of variables w and r, where small r is equal to um, q minus uh, q alpha, 1 plus w alpha times uh, uh, w. <coughs> And, and, and this idea of, of diagonalizing things, of, of course, is, is not new. Um, and uh, uh, you maybe eventually will, will see how to implement this not only at the level of the linearized equation, but also at the level of the uh, full equation. So anticipating a, a little bit, I, uh, for those of you who are familiar with these things, I'll, I'll say that this is uh, very closely related to uh, ideas that first arose uh, in nonlinear wave equations in the work of uh, Ali Nak, who sort of pioneered this idea of choosing the good variable when you solve the equation, and then work of uh, um, David Land closer to, to water waves, work of uh, uh, Al-Azhar, Burke, and Zuili, again, uh, for, for water waves equations. So you want to work with the right variables. You want to diagonalize your system properly. Okay, so what happens when you diagonalize your system properly? Um, so um, let me write down a little bit more of the linearized system. So you have dt. Uh, so, so suppose I, I, I now write the system for w and r. Uh, so I have the uh, system dtw plus b d alpha w plus, and the next term I'll get in here is r alpha divided by 1 plus w bar. 
alpha or n equals, and, and here I'm not going to elaborate. This, this will be some lower order terms, uh, in, in at least in uh, the sense of local theory. Um, but more interesting it will be to write the equation for r, dt of r plus b, the alpha of r. So we start with the transport, uh, which is the, the leading part. And here comes the coupling term with the first equation. And this coupling term has to do with the, with the gravity. And let me make sure I get the correct sign. Um, and this will be I times G plus A, uh, G, yeah, G plus A, um, 1 plus W alpha uh, multiplied by W. And this is, again, some lower order terms, okay? So in, in order here, you see the, f the main features of, of this equation. The first feature, the leading feature, is the transport. The second feature is the coupling between these two, um, be between these two equations. And if you want to th think of something to call a coupling coefficient, that should not be this coefficient or this coefficient, but really should be the product of these two coefficients. And the product of these two coefficients in here, if I multiply them, um, and I can write that here, um, I look at g plus a divided by j, all right? And this is the object that I have, uh, that plays a key role in this analysis and that I have mentioned uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, it's, it's a relatively easy computation to show that this is the normal derivative of the pressure restricted to the free boundary. So the sign of this quantity, the fact that this g plus a uh, quantity is positive, is uh, uh, plays a key role in the well posedness of the system, and that's what's called the Taylor uh, stability condition. So you want this guy to be positive, all right? Else, this equation is no longer locally well posed. What is a? Well, you could define it that, that way, but probably there is a. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm getting to that. Um, so a is equal to um, 2 times uh, the imaginary part of a projection. And this projection is of uh, uh, r times r alpha bar. Sorry. And, uh, and <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> and r is <laughs> q alpha over 1 plus w alpha. Okay, so you, you, you first my hand a little bit here. I had to give something away before it was ready. <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, so let me finish this, this discussion uh, in the following way. Um, so if you look at this equation, one obvious symmetry of this equation is the translation, uh, the invariance with respect to spatial translations, right? And since this equation is invariant with respect to spatial translations, then you have one special solution to the linearized equation, and that's the derivative of the solution. So if I'm looking at w alpha and q alpha, this object will solve the linearized equation. All right, uh, but if I want to study this object properly, uh, using the linearized equation, then I should diagonalize it, right? So what do I get when I diagonalize it? Well, W alpha stays unchanged, okay? But again, a very simple computation will show you that when you diagonalize this, you're going to get the pair of variables W alpha and Q alpha divided by 1 plus W alpha. Um, so um, this means that W alpha and Q alpha is really not the right variable to study this equation in. Instead, you want to study this uh, pair of variables. And that justifies giving a name to this guy in the first place. All right? And once you give it a name, you have to understand what it is. 
right? Uh, and this turns out to have a very simple interpretation. This is really nothing but the, the, the two components of R are the velocity vector field. Uh, the, the two components of the velocity vector field. So R represents the velocity vector field uh, written in a complex form, okay? Um, exactly, if you want to write it down, R will be U minus I V, where U is the horizontal velocity, V is the vertical velocity. <coughs> so one thing uh, we take away from this, this computation is that um, even though this equation is written as uh, an equation in W and Q, it's natural in the first place to differentiate it because it's fully nonlinear. And when you differentiate it and diagonalize it, then you get an equation, a system of equations in these two uh, variables, W, alpha, and R. And this would be the good variables a la Alinac, let's say. Okay? Um, and so to, to relate this perhaps with work that was done by people in the audience, let's say, uh, using, uh, uh, um, using the uh, uh, Eulerian setting, let's say. In the Eulerian setting, this diagonalization happens at the level of the undifferentiated variables, and it involves, uh, to, to do it properly, you have to use paradifferential calculus, uh, which, uh, if we like paradifferential calculus, is nice and good, but here it's, it's, uh, it's nice that you get this diagonalization very simple and uh, algebraically. All right, so um, the last thing going along this line that I want to show you is uh, the system of equations for this uh, differentiated variables uh, for, for W alpha and R. <coughs> All right, let's see how this works out. I, I, I know that, no, no, but I was trying to figure out how hard to push on this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. <coughs> okay. Do you see everything there? Yes. yes. All right. One thing wha which you may have noticed while computing the linearized equations is that I have neglected the effect of the surface tension, uh, and that's because that one does not play any uh, role in this uh, discussion about diagonalization. Diagonalization has nothing to do with the surface tension, has nothing to do with uh, um, also with vorticity. So that those variables will remain the same in all cases. So now I promised you the system for W alpha and R. Um, and here I'm, 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 I run into a bit of problem with my notations because uh, I don't want to really, well, let me not make things more complicated than they should be. Um, so so uh, here's the system. dt of w alpha plus b d alpha w alpha plus 1 plus w 1 plus w bar. Uh, R alpha is equal to 1 plus W uh, M. Just be a little bit patient. Uh, uh, alpha, thank you. Um, and then uh, dt of R plus B d alpha of R uh, uh, minus I times uh, W minus A GW minus A, uh, and I is in front, um, uh, divided by 1 plus W alpha is equal to 0. So I see this, this is a, a pretty manageable system. I wrote this system uh, in this first case, um, and uh, it no longer applies in the case of finite bottom. You have to make some changes there. And one obvious reason why you see it, it doesn't apply, it has this I in here, right? I is bad. I is not holomorphic. Uh, multiplication by i makes sense in the infinite bottom case, but has no meaning uh, in the finite bottom case. 
All right, but in any case, this is our system. And uh, now uh, I'll, I'll try to, to give you some idea about uh, what happens when you try to look at the local well postedness theory for this equation. So now I'm really getting into the problem. Um, but before I get to local well postedness, I, I need to tell you a little bit about the function spaces. And the first thing that I have to show you then is what is the energy for the system. So this system has an energy. Uh, and the energy is uh, integral of W square. Uh, and actually, this is the energy for the system above, OK? Because it's at the level of W and Q uh, times uh, 1 plus uh, real part of W alpha uh, plus the imaginary part of Q Q alpha bar. I might have some wrong signs in here, so don't panic if some things are, don't, are not positive. OK, the, uh, they should be positive. Um, <coughs> so um, uh, two comments about this energy. So there's the corresponding energy, obviously, in Eulerian coordinates. <coughs> this energy, uh, as was discovered by Zakharov, plays the role of the Hamiltonian for the system. Um, one, one thing I'm not going to do for you is I'm not going to write down the symplectic form um, in holomorphic coordinates. That's, if you want, one downside of using holomorphic coordinates. The symplectic form is ugly. Uh, symplectic form is simpler in uh, um, uh, Eulerian coordinates, but, but here it doesn't look so good. Uh, so uh, this uh, energy uh, really corresponds to Noether's theorem because of the time uh, translation invariance of the system. Uh, because uh, you also have uh, uh, spatial invariance with respect to spatial translations, you're also going to have some horizontal momentum, uh, which I'm not going to write down. So uh, you, you can play a little bit with the Hamiltonian structure if you wanted. All of these problems that we're looking at are Hamiltonian, and they all have the same symplectic form. Uh, do they? No. Uh, this one has a different symplectic form. Uh, the one with the vorticity, but the other ones have the same symplectic form. Uh, one thing that we read, and, and I should say one, one last thing, that this energy uh, consists, of, well, consists of two parts, that's obvious. Uh, this part uh, is like the norm of Q in H one half homogeneous square. Okay, It's exactly this, well, up to a constant, perhaps, uh, a factor of two. Uh, this one, you, you want to relate this to um, norm of W in L2 square, right? Um, you have this guy in here. Uh, so is this positive or not? Um, and the answer is to, to this is, is, is very easy. Uh, this energy will, posit it will be positive at least as long as uh, the simplest thing to say is that the um, uh, fluid surface does not have self-intersections. Um, in effect, this energy will still be positive sometimes when you have self-intersections, but you can allow some kinds of self-intersections and not others. I'm not going to elaborate that. But this is essentially a positive object, all right? The energy is positive definite, all right? And so one thing that we read of this energy is the kind of spaces that we need to work in. in. So from here, we see that uh, the, sp the spaces to study our evolution in are spaces of the form L2 cross H1. H1 half homogeneous. And this applies to the first problem. This will change when you move to each of the other problems. They'll have different, uh, slightly different setups. And in particular, this business that I was discussing before with the projector uh, in the case of finite bottom means that in the case of finite bottom, you will no longer control the low frequencies of W properly. Uh, so the energy will will, instead of having the L2 norm of W and here the uh, H1 half norm of Q, will contain norms which are uh, with respect to this uh, space and with respect to the associated inner product. So you lose some low frequency uh, control uh, in the finite bottom case. All right, uh, so, so we, you want to use this space. So you might say, when you look at local well possedness Uh, you want to work with, say, WQ in uh, L, uh, l let me call this space script H, which is L2 cross H1 half. And then when you look at the differentiated variables, W alpha and R, um, 
uh, from here on, for further derivatives, this is the variables you want to work with. Uh, so this should belong to uh, maybe some hs. And let me discuss a little bit this exponent s. All right. And again, this discussion will be specific to problem one. Um, and in the high frequency limit, also specific to three and four, but not to two because two has a very different scaling at high frequency. All problems one, three, and four have the same scaling at high frequency, whereas problem two, uh, the surface tension term uh, takes over at high frequencies. All right. So, so wha what can we say about this exponent s? And uh, one uh, um, thing to look at uh, is whether the problem has scaling. And this uh, problem one in particular does have scaling. Uh, so the scaling is, uh, if you want, uh, written at the level of w alpha, um, w alpha of uh, alpha and t goes into, uh, of, of t and alpha, uh, goes into w alpha of lambda t and lambda square alpha and uh, q and r of t and alpha goes into lambda r of lambda t lambda square alpha. And once you have some scaling, you can compute what is the critical exponent in here. That's very easy to see. So the critical exponent uh, corresponds to s. So um, maybe let's write this here. So s critical is equal to 1 half. All right, uh, and uh, you might say, oh, perhaps we should be looking at solving this problem at this regularity level. But then you remember that this problem is a quasi-linear problem, and to my knowledge, hardly any quasi-linear problem was solved <coughs> at the scaling level. So instead, we're, we're going to give up a little bit, and uh, the exponent that I'll be uh, dealing with primarily today is s is equal to 1. So we'll be one uh, rather than one half, half derivative about the uh, critical level. And for those of you who are familiar with what happens with the nonlinear wave equation, it's exactly the same balance of forces. Uh, the state of the art, so to speak, uh, is more or less about half uh, derivative above uh, the scaling. You can, uh, one can uh, expand this discussion a lot. I don't want to do that. Um, so let's see. All right, so um, um, maybe before I tell you about uh, local wall posedness, I'll tell you about uh, energy estimates. <coughs> and so one sort of twist we introduce in, in this business of uh, energy estimates is actually not a new twist. It's a twist that one has seen all over the place in connection with nonlinear wave equations, namely that when you control the evolution of energy, you don't want to control the evolution of energy in terms of Sobolev norms of the solution. Rather, you want to control the evolution of energy in terms of pointwise norms of the solutions on grounds that these pointwise norms of the solutions are weaker objects. Uh, and they really tell you that the energy will budge only when you have pointwise concentration and not just uh, a large uh, L2 norm or large Sobolev norm. And so in order to do that, uh, one thing that we do in all of these models, we introduce some sort of control parameters. And I will warn you that I'll oversimplify things just a tiny bit in here uh, by less than a log, to put it this way, just to keep things short. So we're going to use two control parameters. Our first control parameter will be uh, what I'll call A. Um, and this will be a scale invariant norm. Uh, so this is norm of W alpha in L infinity plus norm of D 1 half R in L infinity. OK, um, so, so this corresponds exactly to the critical exponent, 1 half. 
Um, and so this means that this constant A can appear in any combination you want in, in your estimates, more or less. And the second control parameter that we're going to use is half a derivative higher. But half a derivative higher, so that would correspond to S is equal to 1. I'll remind you that we work in one space dimension. And in one space dimension, uh, the embedding H1 half into L infinity does not work. Uh, but one thing we were very happy to be able to do in here is to relax this L infinity requirement to a BMO requirement because H1 half homogeneous does embed into BMO. So in here, I'll put BMO norms, uh, D1 half W alpha in BMO plus R alpha in uh, BMO. And uh, maybe, uh, so this is, as I said, half derivative higher. And to get another way of understanding the, the level of regularity for this, uh, I, I'll remind you that uh, when uh, I define that uh, coefficient, uh, the, the transport coefficient b, uh, which was somewhere, uh, did I erase it? The first line. No, first line. Right here. Ah, OK, all right. So, so you see that I, I can rewrite this as two times the real part of R, a projection, projection of R divided by 1 plus uh, W uh, alpha bar. So the leading part of this is the real part of R. Okay, So the fact that you control R alpha in BMO means that you're controlling the uh, derivative of your velocity in BMO. So you don't control the velocity in L infinity. You only ask to control the derivative of the velocity in BMO. And so if you, you do this, then by no means you're going to have uh, energy estimates okay, for, for uh, even a, a transport equation. And so in order to make this work, we have to make use somehow of the fine cancellation structure that's uh, buried into, into the water wave equation. Um, and so what, what is the good energy estimate then for, for our equations? I'll write two types of energy estimates. First of all, energy estimates for the linearized equation. And then energy estimates for, um, uh, for, for the differentiated equation. Now, when you look at the linearized equation, what is the good energy? So uh, Uh, so um, you look in here and you know that the L2 cross the H1 half norm uh, of uh, W and R should be the correct obje object. So let's define this energy, E2 of W and R, to be equal to integral of uh, W square plus the uh, imaginary part of R, R alpha bar, um, the alpha. So this would be the, uh, the good energy for the linearized problem around 0. Uh, maybe I should put a g in here. All right. Uh, but here we're looking at the nonlinear problem. And the coupling between these two equations has the g plus a coefficient in it. And so uh, this g plus a should really appear in your energy. And this is where it appears. And so this is the natural energy for the nonlinear equation. Now, you see also another way where, where this coefficient becomes important. You make sure that your energy is positive definite. Okay? And so what is the, our energy estimate for, for this functional? Uh, d dt of E2 of W and R, just to give you an idea of the flavor of the estimates that we're proving, uh, is smaller than, and here you're going to have an implicit constant, and your implicit constant depends on A, and smaller than B, E2 of W and R. Okay? And now, uh, in terms of energy estimates, we primarily ten tend to think of the energy estimates for the linearized equation rather than for the original equation, because there's more information if you can prove uh, energy estimates for the linearized equation. And so uh, if you look at the original equation, uh, you can have a similar energy estimate, which says that d dt of uh, the energy, same energy, if you want dk w alpha and dk r uh, smaller than a b uh, e2 of the a w 
alpha and d k r with respect to the diagonal variable. So you see the same uh, uh, dependence on the parameter b and uh, the implicit dependence on the parameter a. And at least in the case one, but we, we can also implement this in, in, the, in the second case for the second problem, these estimates are invariant with respect to scaling. Okay. So there isn't much to improve here in terms of, of, of the energy estimates. This, this is as good as they get. And so if you just use this energy estimates, both for the differenti differentiated equation and for the linearized equation, what you're going to end up with is the following theorem. Um, maybe I can use that board. So the theorem would be that the equations uh, 1, uh, 2, and 4, so these are equations which share this uh, scaling in the high frequency limit, are locally well posed for um, uh, W uh, alpha and R belonging to this space H. One, so this corresponds to choosing S is equal to one in there. Um, and uh, some, some uh, comments are, are in order here. Um, so uh, of course, this is not the first time a local wall positiveness theorem was proved. Um, the first uh, local wall positiveness results for uh, water waves uh, are due to uh, Nalimov uh, for small data. Uh, in the case one and to uh, of Syanikov in some sort of Gevray setting for the problem four. Um, of Syanikov was also the guy to introduce this holomorphic coordinates in, in the uh, dynamic problem. Um, the same theorem, and then this guy also now even work with fairly high regularity. Um, uh, the next uh, 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 important result was the result of uh, CJ Wu. Uh, CJ proved uh, well posed uh, again in high sobol of regularity, but for large data. Uh, and her contribution, uh, uh, one, one of her contributions was to figure out the positivity of that uh, 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 normal derivative of the pressure. Um, then I should mention the work of uh, uh, Al-Azard Burke and Zui Li. Uh, their initial work, if I remember correctly, was just a little bit above this. Uh, epsilon above, okay, um, and uh, so uh, that's when when we we were able to get the first results. So we managed to beat them by an epsilon, uh, but then they came back and they said, oh, but this problem is also a dispersive problem. It has three cards estimates, uh, and if you work hard and use those three cards estimates, you can improve this result a little bit more, um, and. Uh, um, uh, and then after them came, uh, um, and I'll apologize if I misspell the name, uh, Nguyen and the, the Poifer. Um, and they improved a little bit more the threshold. And I don't know what the current threshold is. Maybe it's, uh, I'll guess it's 1 8 better than, am I right? Yeah. Something like that, 1 8 better than that by using three cards estimates. However, our energy estimate still remains the, the better one. So we have the right energy estimate, just uh, no, 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 no. We, we did not uh, try to use any, any street cards estimates. And, and there, there's a reason why, why we stuck to the energy estimates, and that's because the energy estimates are the object that's crucial when you uh, look at the problem we really wanted to look, and that's the long time uh, behavior of, of, of these equations. Now, one thing I should say, uh, uh, maybe a few more comments I have in here. Um, when you look at, uh, when you state a local well positiveness result, uh, the correct setting for the, w this is very vague setting, uh, vague uh, 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 terminology if you want. Um, uh, you have to qualify what means local well positiveness. This is a quasi-linear problem, so local well positiveness includes existence. Uh, let me write this here. Um, existence 
uniqueness um, means continuous dependence on the initial data. But what you don't get, because the problem is quasi-linear, you don't get uh, better, you don't get any sort of uniformly continuous dependence on the initial data. So this is in some sense optimal. Um, another uh, thing we were uh, keen to do and, and we were able to do is um, in, in here we have these parameters. We have, uh, let's say when you move from the first case to the fourth case, you have the depth. Uh, and we wanted to have this uh, results uniform with respect to at least some of the parameters <laughs> in here. Um, and so uh, what I can add in here is that this result is uniform as the depth uh, goes to infinity. Uh, and it's also uniform as the vorticity goes to zero. So you can take those limits if you want uh, and have uniform estimates for them. Um, let's see. Uh, another... Uh, Okay, may, maybe maybe this this uh, this concludes the remark about the local uh, well posedness theorem, um, and that that brings me to the the topic of uh, of the next lecture where I'll I'll try to tell you about uh, the long time uh, estimates for the equation. Um, I, my my plan was to get to that today. I'll confess, but uh, it, it did not happen, and I, I I did not want to rush the first part because I know that many of you have not seen uh, much of this stuff uh, before. So uh, if you lose it early on, then uh, the last lecture will be useless. Um, but nevertheless, next time I'll try to tell you as much as I can about the uh, long time uh, estimates for, for this problem. And that's it for today. This uh, technology allows you to have non-graph uh, uh, initial data. Right. So uh, once you write down uh, this uh, sets of equations, you no longer care whether your initial data came from a graph or not. Um, and um, maybe one thing that I was uh, planning to show to you, but again, I did not have time to, is uh, the proof of the positivity of the normal derivative of the pressure. Uh, our proof, not, not CJ's proof, uh, because that proof applies regardless of whether your uh, uh, curve has uh, self-intersections or anything like that. Um, so uh, one can formally continue these solutions past self-intersections. There's no, absolutely no issue with that, except you lose the physical interpretation, right? What you model is no longer a wave. It's just your favorite PDE, let's say, but... Uh, <laughs> or most hated PDs, depending, um, but uh, has nothing to do with the self-intersections. Thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, uh, so you say you have local well postness for 1, 2, and 4, um, but all of those cases have mm -hmm. C equals 0, so I'm mm -hmm. a little confused about the... Uh, we, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. 1, 3, and 4. Thank you very much. 1, 3, and 4, right. Um, and uh, so uh, since you asked the question uh, or pointed this, I'll say that there is uh, the corresponding result for problem two is also true, except that you have to fiddle a little bit with the numbers because that problem has a different scaling. Okay. Can I, if I can make another remark, I meant to make this remark uh, early on and I forgot about it. So as you see, we have these four parameters that we're looking at, uh, but we're looking at uh, just uh, four, four of these problems. Uh, and uh, actually, there is a much larger variety of problems than one can uh, study in here. That's, this is one nice thing about uh, uh, water waves is a, is a great <coughs> playground. You can find lots and lots of equations, very different dispersion relations, very different uh, dynamical properties, lots of interesting problems to, to study.